Hi everyone, uh, my name is Charlotte and today I'm going to be making some ceramic sake cups and a sake hey pour. Uh, my name is Charlotte. Hi guys! <laughs> um, okay, so to start, I need to prep my clay. This bag is pretty dusty, so I'm gonna clean up some of the dust before I get started just because it won't be, it's not great to work with all that dust. I'm gonna get some water as well. Yeah, so this is just a wire tool, um, and it is just for cutting. Um, you generally use this if you want to cut clay, but also when you throw on the wheel, um, after you throw, this is how you take it off. You cut underneath, and then, um, then you can lift the piece off of the wheel head. Right now what I'm doing is making this into a ball, just kind of more uniform, um, except for I'm going to kind of have the underside be flat since I'm hand building. Um, 
And I'm not much of a hand builder. I normally do wheel stuff. Um, it's just, it's really cold out. And um, my hands would stop working after a bit in the cold. It's just how it goes. But we'll see how this turns out. It's good practice. So uh, this is going to be the sake pour a bit. And I literally just had this idea too. So we make like a hole. And then I'm just gonna, the method that I'm using right now is hand building. So I'm just gonna keep pinching around, making the hole bigger. And then eventually the clay will be compressed and thinned out and I'll have a much bigger shape. Um, I really like pinch pots. I'm not the best at it, but I think you get a lot more organic forms this way, whereas on the wheel, everything's more uniform. Um, and so I like to see all the, you know, indentations and you can, in the clay, you can really see that it was made by someone's hands, you know? I'm not sure what the groundhog predicted today, um, but it looks like, according to the weather, it looks like it's going to be pretty cold for at least the next week, but hopefully after that, we'll get some warmer days. Usually around 50 degrees, it's okay to pot, it, or it's way more comfortable, but once you go under 50, it's, it's kind of brutal down there. So as you can see, you get more of a bowl shape. You got the flat bottom. This process just takes some time, but it's nice. It's really meditative. Oh no, six more weeks of winter. I feel like that's always the prediction. So you wanna make sure the base isn't too thick and this is a skill I'm still kind of perfecting. My hand-built pots are generally way heavier than my throne pots. And that's typically a sign of a, like a, a skilled potter. One way to test is how heavy their stuff is. Um, which is funny because among people who don't make pottery, if you like pick up a mug and it's really heavy, I feel like most people's first thought is like, wow, that's a really sturdy, like well-made mug. But potters like, if they pick up a mug and it's super heavy, they're like, wow, this wasn't, very well made. So trying to thin out this base so that it's just a bit more functional. And it'll be, the little cups, the little sake cups will be a lot easier. It'll be interesting to see how this pour turns out since I'm gonna try and make it all in one go without any drying of the base. It should be okay since the form is pretty simple um, and it won't be putting too much weight on this bottom part. Um, so I think it'll be okay, but we'll see.
Yeah, definitely. A thicker base would be heavier overall. Um, same with thick walls. Um, just any excess clay, really, will make it heavier. Um, but usually the excess clay tends to be concentrated at the bottom. Um, and that's true for this type of pinch pot and also for like throwing on the wheel. I'm not entirely sure why, but there always tends to be a lot of clay that ends up at the bottom, like when you're first starting out. Um, and that's where trimming comes in, which is great because trimming is like when the pot gets dry enough, you can flip it over and trim the excess clay off the base. Um, and so it's an opportunity to kind of, um, you know, fix that if, if you want to. Um, there's something else I was going to say, I forgot. Oh yeah. Sometimes like if you're throwing like a bowl on the, on the wheel, or maybe if that's, this could be true with hand building too, like. Um, you want to have support, so sometimes potters will purposefully leave excess clay on the bottom to support the wet clay, um, and so the form doesn't collapse, and then they'll trim it off later, um, because when the clay is wet, it's too, it's too weak to hold a certain amount of weight, but once it's dry, it's not an issue, and you trim the excess clay off, and it's a good system. So I think what my plan is, is I'm going to do this. I'm going to make the base or finish the base of the pourer. And then I'm going to set it aside while I make the four little sake glasses. Um, just so that this has a little chance to dry. Like, it probably won't dry very much, but we'll just give it a second. You want to make sure that you're not, like you want, you don't want excess clay, but you also don't want to make the walls too thin because it, it's relatively easy to just put your whole finger through, <laughs> which would also not be good. So if you can kind of tell, I'm pinching the bowl inwards um, because that's the shape that I want the pourer to take. I kind of want it to be, you know, bigger at the base and then become more narrow at the top so that it's more, you know, most of the liquid is held at the bottom and then you have the narrow neck and then it can pour easily. Um, but you don't have to do that. If I was making maybe like a planter or like a a bowl with like a wide rim, I would just kind of change the direction and way in which I was pushing. I'd like push out rather than like doing this kind of cupped thing I'm doing here. So as you can see, the walls are getting a lot thinner.
when did I learn? Actually, shout out to NC State um, Craft Center, because that's where I learned most of what I know. Um, I took a pottery class when I was like 11. I thought it was cool. Um, and then after that class, I kind of didn't really do it much. Like, you know, there's a lot of tools and equipment you need to be able to, to make pottery um and so then I forgot about it for a while but my grandma started to make pottery um and so whenever I'd go visit her she had like a studio in her basement and you know I would just play around down there I thought it was fun um and then when I got to NC State I did some research and I found out that they had a craft center that offered pottery classes and I was like sign me up so I signed up for two back-to-back -back classes. I signed up for the intro to wheel class and I signed up for their continuing wheel class, um, which is good. I think the fact that it was back-to-back -back really like made pottery part of my routine. Um, but yeah, from that point on, I just was always a member, a studio member of the NC State Craft Center. And some semesters I took classes and other semesters I didn't. Um, but that's where I learned most of what I know. Gotta test that weight. Um, the bottom is still a little bit thick. I don't want to push the clay too hard though. Mm -mm. I'd rather have it be thicker on the bottom and have it just be a little bit heavier than, than have it break a hole into the side. So. Oh, awesome job, moderator. They um they're off they're offering the NC State Craft Center, which the moderator linked in the chat. Um they're offering a bunch of online classes right now because of the pandemic. Um, but they also offer like socially distant um socially distant classes right now, um, in person. Cause some things are hard to do without all the proper equipment. Um, and some of those things, like, I know, I think they do, like, you can pick up materials for the online ones, but, like, you can't really pick up a pottery wheel. Um, so, yeah, highly recommend checking out the craft center. Um, their classes fill up pretty quick, especially the ceramics classes, and especially now I think they have reduced capacity because of social distancing, so if you're interested, you definitely have to be on top of the deadlines and um, students I believe get like access to classes to registering for classes before the general public um, which is cool you kind of get a head start I'm happy with this. Um, as you can tell, I think it's this side is a little bit, it's not quite even the rim, um, but that's okay because when I, um, when I add on to it, um, I can kind of 
you know, put more on the side that there isn't enough on. Um, and there are, there are different ways to, like, build off this form. I could do um, coils. Um, or I'm going to do stuff with slabs. So I will get to that later. But I'm going to put this aside for now. Kind of let it dry. Um, also, yeah, they do have studios for people to use. They have really, like, comprehensive, well-equipped studios, too. Um, and it's not just for students. It's for, like, the general public. Like, there are a lot of people that you get to meet from the, like, general community who are working in there, which is pretty cool. Um, there's a big community of makers at the NC State Craft Center, and um, it's always cool to see what people are making and it's kind of what I make mostly at home now um I have a wheel and I fire at a place in Durham because the NC State Craft Center has a rule that you can't make pots and fire them if you're not making the pots in the actual NC State Craft Center studio um and yeah so I I do it at a place in Durham now but um wait where was I going with this Long story short, I'm not, I'm just not at this craft center anymore, but I do miss, I remember what I was going to say, I miss seeing what everyone was making all the time. It was really cool and it inspired me a lot to see everyone's, you know, cool stuff. Um, so now I'm gonna, let's see, what am I going to do? I'm going to make the littler glasses, I think. And let's see, where's the other one? Okay, there it is. Let's see here. For uniformity's sake, I could weigh these, but the battery in my scale died, so I can't weigh them right now. But a lot of potters will do that to make sure that, you know, different pieces of a set are. Um, pieces of a set are all the same size or relatively similar. I definitely agree with you. It is really nice to be in a creative environment with others. I think it's just inspiring. It's hard that with COVID, you know, those environments can exist, but not as intimately as they could before. So um, now I'm just essentially making another smaller ball so that I can make the little glasses. As you can see, like I'm trying to get rid of the little lines and stuff. These aren't too big. I might have to screw up this one if it, if it gets too big, which I think it is. We'll see. 
Ceramics also shrink when you put them in the kiln, so something that you think looks too big might come out the perfect size, because I think the shrinkage rate is like 13%, but it depends on the clay. It's, but it's usually somewhere between like 10 and 13%. Um, do you keep different kinds of clay for different projects? What kind are you using here? Um, yeah, so definitely. I'd say different clay bodies um, behave in different ways. So porcelain, for example, is like a super fine white clay um, that's kind of more difficult to work with. Like porcelain is good um, for wheel throwing, but you have to be really careful when you like attach different pieces to it. So like if you threw a mug and you attached a handle, like um, it's not going to react the same way as if you used, um, a stoneware or an earthenware clay. I don't actually know. I can look, let me look up, um, because this clay is called speckled brownstone, um, and it's good because I really like it because it's speckled when it comes out of the kiln. I think a lot of it is potter's choice, but, like, for certain projects, like, if you're going to make something that, um, you know, like something hand-built that has a lot of different attachments or, like, when you're building it is going to be, like, altered a lot, you want to use something with a lot of grog. And grog is essentially, like, just little bits of sand um, that kind of makes the clay stronger. And porcelain doesn't have any grog. It's like so fine. So you have, that's why you don't use very much water. You got to be really careful. Um, but yeah, this is called speckled brownstone. Let me see what kind of clay it is exactly. Okay, I'm pretty sure it's an earthenware clay. I don't even know what the difference is between earthenware and stoneware, which might be bad. So I'm going to look that up now too. And then I'll, I'll tell you what it is. Okay, here it is. The difference between earthenware and stoneware is that Earthenware is derived from clay and features a much more porous surface than stoneware. Additionally, it is fired at a lower temperature and must be glazed or painted before use. Earthenware is often a more economical choice of dinnerware, but it tends to chip and break much easier than stoneware. I never knew that. Also, one thing I'd say about different kinds of clay is it also depends on how you're glazing it and how you're firing it. So, like, there's a certain kind of technique of pottery or type of way to fire it called raku. Um, and when you do a raku firing, you're generally firing at lower temperatures. Um, but there's, like, a special type of raku clay for raku glazing and firing and there's also a special type of glaze for raku firing so it really all depends i know that was like a really long-winded answer and i went all over the place but i hope i answered your question
this is kind of big. I think I'm going to try and do it with a smaller piece of clay and see if it comes out a bit different. I think I just used too much on that. Oh no. <laughs> this is what happens when your wire tool isn't pulled taut enough. A much smaller chunk of clay. Let's see if it makes a better sized little shot glass. It's actually harder, like the smaller size, or like the, if you have a smaller amount of clay, because it's like, my fingers just like aren't small enough for this. Okay. Let me try my pinky. No, my pinky nail's too long. I think this is going to be a better size in general. See? I have to keep in mind to be like pushing up rather than pushing out because then it'll create more of a bowl shaped when we want more of a cup shape, which is what happened here. So basically what the process looks like now is just making four of these because I want the set to have four cups. This is actually these little mini pinch pots. It was the first thing I ever learned how to hand build um, because after my two wheel classes that, that following semester I took an intro to hand building. Um, and this was the first time I learned how to make a piece of paper. Do I have a favorite thing to hand build or a favorite thing to make on the wheel? Hmm. So hand building, definitely this style of hand building, like the pinch pots is my favorite style. Um, because I like, um, you know, it's just nice to like touch the clay. I don't know. I find it really relaxing. Um, but I think in terms of what I like to hand build, I really like to hand build um, vases because I think the hand built vases are prettier than the thrown vases because you get the organic forms that you don't really get on the wheel. Um, and next time maybe I'll um, bring some examples of some of the stuff I've made before. Um, 
like some of my favorite things I've hand built or wheel thrown. But um, favorite thing to make on a wheel is I don't know. Um, let me think. I really like to make pedestal planters. I think that's probably my favorite right now. Pedestal planters because you throw them in two parts. Like you throw the first bit, which is like the part that holds the plant. Um, and then you throw the second bit, which is like the base, which is kind of like a cone with a flat top. Um, and then you attach the two. Um, and I just think it makes like a really cool, like contemporary looking planter. Um, and I really like the ones I've made so far and I can definitely go through the process of making one when I start doing stuff on the wheel. These little guys are taking longer than I thought, which is fun. I think if I start to run out of time, I'll probably just make the, the rest of the little ones later and then finish the, or try to finish the other one, the, the portal. Yeah, the pedestal planners are really fun. Um, I don't have any right now. I don't have any made, and I don't have any that I've made. Um, but one day, one day you'll see them. <laughs> Ooh. Uh -oh. So I think my plan with these little guys is to, I'm going to wait until they're leather hard and then I'm going to attach like a little ring base to the bottom and that way they'll look kind of less like, like they're, um, the, it'll give it a little bit more height so that it'll look more like a cup. Um, but so far I'm pretty happy with the shape. Um, but essentially, you know, just roll out like a flat, um, what is it? You know, just like roll out a coil of clay and score and slip and attach it to the bottom. And then it'll act like a nice ring and it'll also keep surfaces from being scratched because less of the rough like bottom will be on the table. Um, and those are pretty, like in most ceramics, you'll see they can be trimmed or they can be attached, but you'll see those like foot rings. I don't think I'll put one on the, or maybe I will, on the portal, we'll see. Okay. This is good for now. I might attach, um, maybe I'll attach like another inch of clay to make it more like a cup shape, but I'll decide about that later. Here's to making another one. It's actually quite hard to like, um, get it into a circular shape. I think I prefer working with larger amounts of clay. I've never really hand built anything this small besides that first little pinch pot I was telling you guys about. I'm not used to it. You can also like manually like with your finger smooth out any of the little things the main thing is you just don't want there to be air bubbles in in the clay because um, if you fire a piece with air bubbles 
it could, you know, explode or crack or break in the kiln, um, which no one wants. I'm moving a bit faster now. I guess I'm getting used to it. <laughs> the first one was trial and error. I think I'm definitely going to add a little thing to the top. But maybe I won't. That's the beautiful thing about clay is you can make decisions as you go. You want to make sure to flatten the base. I think I might have already said this, but just a good thing to know is to flatten the base is good so that it's not, you know, wobbly when it when it's when it's done. You want it to to stand well on its own. I think what I'm gonna do. Maybe only make two of these for now. Oh no, maybe I'll only make four. Um, and we'll see where it goes from there. Would you say hand building is a bit more accessible for people to get into because it doesn't require a wheel? I would definitely say that for sure because wheels are like, I don't know, I think they start at like $300 or $400 and there's like a bunch of equipment that you need to. Um, while I, I would say that hand building is more accessible, but I think pottery in it, in and of itself is kind of, not accessible because like it's not like knitting you know you need like a kiln to really do anything uh, there's air dry clay and you can like paint it with like an acrylic sealant or something but those aren't food safe I'm pretty sure um but like if you truly want to get into pottery you need to like you can do the hand building bed at home but you need to find a kiln um, and there are lots of studios who will let you, like, make at home and then fire for a fee. Um, and that's what I do because I can't afford a kiln. So there's – where I do it is um, Claymakers in Durham. They have this, like, essentially you just um, bring your pots there um, and pay to fire them. I think it's – 
It's 125 for a full kiln load to do a bisque firing and a glaze firing because pots need to be fired twice um, in general. And like there's the first bisque fire and then the glaze fire. But anyway, it's 125 for both of those. And uh, kilns are different sizes, but for them, a full kiln load is like 40 to 45 pieces, which if you're selling them, you can make that money back. Um, but I mean, you can also like, you don't have to do a full kiln load. You could be like, I have this one piece and they would fire it for you. Um, and there are a lot of places like that. I don't know of any other in any others around the area. Cause like the NC State Craft Center, for example, wants you to make it in house. I do sell my pieces. Um, where do I sell them? Mostly I sell them on my Instagram, um, which is underscore Claytown. Um, but I also have a website called Claytown Ceramics. Um, and I don't have anything listed up there because the studio that I fire my pieces at is actually closed until further notice because they just moved. Um, so... It'll be, I don't know, probably another month before I can get anything fired. So I just don't have anything to sell at the moment. But pretty soon I think I'm going to move from selling on Instagram to selling on my website or Etsy. I'm not entirely sure yet, but I will keep Instagram updated. I'm also going to have some pieces at the NC State Student Art Sale um, this fall goes well. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, and the NC State Student Art Sale is another really great resource for students that have influences. Okay, see this one is different than the other. This one is like... Um, more how I want it. I guess there was a learning curve there because this one is more like a cup whereas this is more like a little bowl but I'll make the other one like this and then I think it's all good. Maybe I'll just scrap those two and make, one. make some new ones but I don't think. They look so cute. <laughs> Another thing that the foot ring helps with is stability, I think, especially in your hand built pieces. But that's what I want.
Oh, thanks, Isaac. He listed some info about the student art sale. It's a really good, good thing. I've entered it every every year I've been at state, and I've always had good luck with selling, which is it's cool. I think they make, I don't know what the number is, but they sell like thousands of dollars worth of student art every year. And it's cool. There are a lot of people who are really interested in buying student art there. And it's all online. It was, they used to host it in Tally, but now it's all, it's all online. And they just make like a, an online gallery. And that's how people, um, that's how people list their pieces and stuff. So this piece over here is actually drying a little bit, which is good. It's good to not. I'm glad that I won't be adding onto it when it's like completely fresh and wet. I remember the first time I tried to. Um, the first time I tried to make like a really big pinch pot thing, and I didn't allow for any drying time and it just completely collapsed so such is life <laughs> um, oh yeah Isaac that's a good idea um I think I can write in the chat let's see Oh, I got a login. Which I do have a login. I'll just I'll Discord. I'll Discord you. Um, there you go. Um, let me remember what I was trying to do. Okay. Click. This piece of clay had some air bubbles in it, and so I'm just trying to smooth it out so that it doesn't give me any problems in the kiln. Um, and as you can tell, the rims aren't perfect, but I like that. I like the way that looks. That's like, I spend so much time making stuff on the wheel, and my goal is like uniformity always when I'm on the wheel and so it's really nice to take a break from that and do hand building stuff um, and get all the funky shapes that come so naturally um okay so now let me move these guys I um I might come back and rebuild a couple more cups um to replace one of the ones I'm not happy with. But I might not. We'll see. I think they'll look different too when I add the the little rim on the bottom. This one's my favorite, by the way. Um, 
But yeah, now I'm going to, this is kind of a circular shape. I think I'm going to try and get it to be a little bit more rectangular so that when I roll it out, it's, um, it rolls out in a rectangular shape. Or it won't quite be rectangular, but you get the gist. Um, so I don't have a slab roller. A slab roller is a tool that you can put blocks of clay through and it'll give you a perfectly even slab. I have a rolling pin because um, we're at home. I actually do have a slab roller downstairs, but the one at the craft center was really nice and fancy and it was like a standing up one and it was like three times the size of me and it was just really, it's what I learned on. So, but the one I have downstairs is like, um, it lays flat on the table and you have to use special boards to make sure all of the, you have to use special boards to make sure all of the, like the slab is the same size. And that's how you adjust the size of the slab is by adding more cardboard or not cardboard, wooden boards. Um, whereas the one at the craft center was just like a little knob that you twisted that would make the slabs bigger or smaller and then you'd start rolling. But anyway, rolling pin. Um, it's pretty big, like, <laughs> um, for what I'm doing. I think I'm going to be using a smaller rolling pin and I also don't have much room to roll, but we make do. If I was going to be building, like, I don't know, something where it was really important to me for it to be all uniform, I would probably use the slab roller downstairs. Um, but the fact is, like, I'm hand building it, and, like, there are discrepancies in the thicknesses of this one. And so it doesn't really matter that much here, as long as it's, like, generally all the same size. Here, let me move this down as you can see. It's okay. So what I'm going to be doing with this is I'm going to be adding it to like the walls to make it taller. Yeah. I kind of want it to be cool. Like I don't want it to be square. I want it to be rectangular so that I can get longer pieces to save me time later. Definitely recommend doing this with more room than I'm doing it. I think that thickness is pretty good. Um, it's pretty uniform. Once you practice, well, I don't know, it's pretty easy to use rolling pin. Um, so now I'm gonna take this, this is called a rib. <laughs> yeah, it is, a, it's a big rolling pin. <laughs> um, also thank you for the shout out. Um, this is called a rib. You can get them in varying, like, I don't, I don't know if consistency is the word, but like firm, firmness. This one's like pretty flexible. I like the ones like this, um, but the ones that are thicker can do different things. So this one's just nice for like, the canvas has a certain pattern on it. And so when you do this, you're compressing the clay and you're also just making it smooth all over, which is good. It's not that big of a deal if like you forget and the canvas pattern is on your piece because chances are like when you're pinching it, at least like that goes away. 
because you're like touching it. But also, um, also when you glaze it normally, you don't see the pattern anymore either. I can see a couple of little air bubbles in here. So then you can take a needle tool and kind of pop them. And then smooth again so that the clay kind of fills up where the puncture is and you get all the air out. I got some of them. But I'm still this one is still having issues. Yeah. There we go. It's a little better. I just might not use that one little section. This particular activity seems a lot like applying vinyl decals to windows. I don't think I've ever done that, actually. But is that is that just the vinyl decals? Are those just like the... Yeah, okay, no, I see what you mean. I've never done that, but I've seen people do that before. Okay, so now... Exacto. Um... <laughs> Did you have to do it um, for Anaset decorations or something? These are little exacto heads. Um, I lost the base that you screw these into. Um, so probably not my most safe tool, but I make sure all four of them end back up in here. So it's all good. Um, so now I'm going to be attaching to this little guy to make, you know, the narrower part of the sake pour. Um, and so basically, I'm going to cut strips of this and attach it to the base. Uh, and the way you do this is I normally kind of line it up inside. And in this process, it kind of gets all like the rim isn't going to be all even, um, but at the end you can just cut it and make an even rim, and so it ends up being fine. But now, uh, basically I'm just going to smush the clay or pinch the clay into the base, and it's still soft enough for me to do that, which is good. You have to be careful when you dry it, because sometimes the, dry, the clay can get too, too dry and it won't really do what you want it to do. I'm pinching it in on the inside. The inside doesn't need to be as pretty, but it does need to be sealed well. Or else the walls will be too thin. I like to do the inside first. Kind of a fun shape. Okay, so now I'm going to be pulling the clay up like this so that you lose this kind of seam. Uh, 
Um, and in the end, some potters will like paddle. It's a special like wooden paddle tool that you can use to kind of alter the form. I don't have one. Sometimes I'll like slap it with the rib. Um, <laughs> no, you would not want a sake leak, Isaac. That would not be good. It's funny, actually, my grandma, um, who used to do pottery, she took, she told me a story about why she stopped taking commissions. Um, essentially, like, <laughs> she, a woman commissioned two mugs from her, and when you're throwing on the wheel, you need to make sure that you have enough clay on the bottom, like, on your base, like, because there's the problem where it's too thick, but there's also a problem when it's too thin. Um, and it's easy, like, when you're pushing down in the centered piece of clay to go all the way down to the wheel head, uh, and then you just wouldn't have a bottom. And so one thing that potters do is they'll take a needle tool like this and they'll stick it in the bottom of their pot and kind of just, like, see how far it went. And you usually want, like, a quarter of an inch. But anyway, she did that and she forgot to, like, you close the hole up with your finger, but she just forgot to do that, and so she made this woman a set of mugs, but one of them just had a hole in the bottom <laughs> and it leaked, which I thought was so funny, but that's why she didn't take commissions after that point on. Okay, so I'm just going back around to double check that I, you know, really closed up the seam and the clay is really attached. So now there's different consistencies, like it's kind of thicker at the top and thinner where I pinched. And so once I make like once I finish up with the little seam inside, I will go through and pinch and make sure that the thickness is all relatively the same. Um, and the hole, it stayed the same. So I think my grandma didn't even realize that there was a hole um, because it was so small, but it just like just leaked a, just a little bit. <laughs> And there's like, I don't think there was any really real way to fix it, you know? I guess she could have refired it, but she didn't. I kind of felt an air bubble in here, so I really hope it doesn't break or explode in the kiln. But the thing about air bubbles is sometimes that'll happen. Sometimes it'll break or, you know, you'll have an issue, but... Sometimes you can just get away with it, and you never really know what's going to happen. Okay, so now it's kind of, you know, I got to add that side, but it's taller than it was. So... size.
think I'm probably going to have to, in order to get the size I want, I'm probably going to have to roll this piece out with the big rolling pin, the industrial size rolling pin. So right now I'm just kind of measuring to make sure that this little piece is going to fit where it needs to and do the right thing. It's kind of like a, a fun puzzle when you do this bit. And like, there are more, probably more efficient ways to do this, but this is just the technique that I use and it's, it's worked for me thus far, so. Here I'm just kind of getting rid of some of the excess that I don't need. So far I'm pretty happy with like how this is looking. As I said before, hand building is not my forte. I definitely have way more practice throwing on the wheel. So this is good practice. I'm pretty, I'm happy that this time is like set aside. Make it so you guys can see. Yeah, it's fun. I pottery is so fun. Also, hand building is nice because you can see more of the process come together all in one go. And I like that. And if I finish these before, like if I finish this set before next week, um, I'll, sh I'll show what it looks like, like the finished product. Um, and who knows whenever I'll be able to fire it, but I'll show that too once it's fired. I think it'd be cool to enter this in the student art sale. I want to make a wheel thrown one and I want to make a handout one, which is this one. But I think it'd be cool to like see the difference between my handout set and my wheel thrown set. I can definitely feel the clay getting drier, and that's because it's been sitting out so long, like the pieces that I haven't started using yet. But in some ways, that's good. It's definitely not too dry to work with, so that's good. But Give it another 50 minutes and it would it's gonna get pretty difficult, so time is of the essence. What is that, Jason? Would I be willing to record the firing so you can see it? I can not the actual firing, because essentially like what I do is I drop the pieces off. Like I can I can record a couple of things though. Like I can record the um, the glazing process and like what the kilns look like, but it's like a pretty closed process. Like it's just like a big container thing made of like these cinder blocks, and then like you close the lid, and then it's kind of like an like a like a little oven. Then you open it, and they're ready. Um, there are other like. We just use electric kilns at the claymaker's place that I fire, but there are other like really cool ways to fire pieces that I just don't have access to right now. But like Raku firing, um, which I, I did one December 2019 at the NC State Craft Center. And that one's fun because you're outside and like you could record yourself firing it because essentially like 
you put it in this big like this big outdoor kiln and you can lift it like you can lift the lid up and then you go in with these big metal tongs and you grab your piece which is at like 1800 degrees and then you bring it over to like a metal trash can with a bunch of newspaper and straw and sawdust and stuff and you plop it in and then you put the lid on top um and then you get your piece which that's pretty cool because most firing takes like 24 hours but the raku firing is like one of the only kinds of firing where you get your piece right after you fire it which there's like not much instant gratification in pottery and so it's nice for a change to have some of that but i will definitely record the glazing process I feel like I always have to remember what I'm doing. Attaching more. Yeah, you're welcome, Jason. You kind of have to like push it into the clay so that it sticks and it doesn't fall in. <laughs> yes, it is very hot. And what's interesting, raku firing is considered a low fire. Like the NC State gas kiln fires to like 2,000. 2,500, maybe even 3,000 degrees, um, which is pretty crazy. Like, I think they fire as high as you can fire, which is cone 10. Um, and the cone system is like the way, like, you, you fire, like, there's a, like, a numbered system for how hot you're firing your pieces. And it, like, it goes from cone something all the way to cone 10. Like you, like I fire my stuff at cone six, which is like medium hot. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's pretty crazy how hot it gets. We had to have the, these like protective gloves and glasses in order to do it. There are people who make really, really cool stuff with this technique, like some really cool vases. Um, and I made a vase that I really like. It's downstairs. I'll get it before it's time to sign off, actually, um, that I made. That's a cool form. I'm really happy with it. I think it's one of my favorite things I've ever made. It's just, it's tough to time all the drying and stuff because, like, when you make more complex forms like that, you do have to factor drying into it and it's easy to let it dry too much or, you know, not time it right. Also, I struggle with like being impatient. You know, when I start making, I wanna make the whole thing, um, which sometimes you just can't, like you have to do it in stages. Um, and it, the same goes for the wheel, so I don't know, like, why I struggle with the patience part of hand building so much, but I think it's, I think it has something to do with, like, the fact that, like, this clay feels workable, because it's, like, when you throw on the wheel, it's really wet, and so, like, literally, if you try to, like, do the next steps of pottery after you've just thrown a piece, like, if you went to trim it, it just wouldn't work, it would just collapse, whereas this, like, the collapse of a piece is much slower and so you kind of get the illusion that you can work with clay because you think it's dry enough but it's not i've lost many a piece that way where 
it was just the wet clay was the clay was too heavy and the clay on the bottom just couldn't support it which is I was kind of worried about it with this but I think it's gonna be okay actually because it had time to dry while I was making the little the little glasses It's getting, it's getting thinner and thinner at the top, which is what I wanted. How long does it take from start to finish? Um, for this, well, it's been an hour and a half, but I will come back. Like, I'm going to finish the other half an hour of the stream. And by then, hopefully, I'll be done with this form. Although I'm not entirely sure I will be. Um, maybe four hours? Because i got to also attach the little bottoms onto these guys. Um, but then if you factor in, if you factor in, like, um, firing or, like, glaze time, too, um it would be longer. I think four hours with the glazing and everything total, but then I also have to drive to the studio to get it fired, so that's more time, and then, um, yeah. If you were talking about, like, start to finish, as in, like, when I started making it to when I got the finished piece back, like, regardless of making time, I'd say, like, a month, because I take my pots in batches to the studio that I fire at, um, and it usually takes me some time to make like 45 pieces. So um, it, it definitely is a long process between like uh, start to finish, like regardless of making time. Like usually they take a long time to make, but it also takes a long time to get back. Yeah. Um, if I had my own kiln, it'd be much shorter, but I don't have my own kiln. I thought about it this summer, but I didn't have the money. It's kind of tilting one way, so I'm going to try to fix that. I know I said earlier I wasn't going to put a foot ring on this, but I think I'm going to. I think it kind of needs it. Okay. This is where it kind of feels like a puzzle because you can like fit your old scraps into, into the little slots. Oh, it's not quite big enough. Come on. If you ever see ceramics like priced really high and you're like, oh, I wonder why that is. All of this like little tedious work is like definitely the reason. And it kind of sucks like for makers because at least pottery makers, like I feel like people will make a pair of earrings and sell it for the same price as like a potter would sell a pot that took them so much longer. Um, but there's like, there's like a cap on the market, I guess, because people are only going to buy a bowl for so much money. So I feel like most potters, unless they're really famous, kind of undersell their work. Especially me. I definitely undersell my work because I would rather it go to people. You know, I'd rather people have it than not have it at all. 
And I'd rather not have a million pieces of pottery in my house. <laughs> It really is so, like, pricing is so hard for handmade stuff. Like, I don't know how to fix the problem. Like, because handmade stuff is just, I don't know. It's better quality, but no one wants to pay for it if you can get the same thing for the same, or not the same thing, but if you can get something similar for the same price off Amazon. But there are lots of small-scale makers who are, who make a living and do it successfully, so... There's definitely a market for the handmade stuff, which is cool. Okay. I'm just... You can see the little inside bit. It's tough to not undervalue while also privileging access. It also stinks when people don't like to pay for people's work. Yeah, I'm with you, Jason. It's a, it's, it's a tough thing. You got to find like a balance. Yeah, that's big facts. If they want to give Jeff Bezos more money, they can go right ahead, I guess. Yeah, crocheting is, like, very similar because it's also super time-consuming. I tried to get into it, but I wasn't very good at it. It didn't stick um, just because I got, I got so confused um, with all the special knots and stuff. But anyway, yeah, I think that's another craft where people really struggle with it. I think the, like, the best handmade business to get into is honestly earrings because I see people, like, um, you know, they'll just like attach beads to, to, to little jewelry. I don't know, like the little things, but it doesn't take as much time and they can sell their stuff for nice prices. And so I think that would be like, if I were to pick up another trade, I might go into earring making. Yeah, I think people definitely don't realize how much time something takes to make, especially like, I don't know, things that are so like readily available today. Like, I mean, like sake pourers, like you can just go on the internet and buy it real cheap. That was probably made in a factory or like same with blankets. And um, I think people people just don't really realize that when you make it by hand, it takes so long. And how long does it take to crochet a blanket? I feel like that's like hours and hours and hours and hours and hours. The shape is coming together a bit more. It's a little bit wonky on the top, but that will go away in time. I think it's probably time for me to roll again. I'm gonna like get all my scraps together. I'm running out of space on the canvas. Let me put this here. Okay industrial size rolling pin time. Oh wait, no, I jumped again. I have to make this all one size. I should have wrapped up the clay. That's my bad. Because it's getting kind of dry, but what else? I 
sister does crochet as a sort of whatever, I got a few minutes free time hobby, so sometimes she'll take two. That seems like the best way to do it. That's why I wanted to take it up because like pottery is very involved. Like you couldn't really make a pot while watching TV just because it's like also pretty messy. Um, and so I wanted to have a craft that I could do um, in the in-between times. And also like I used to only make pottery when the NCSU craft center was open, like before I moved to doing my pottery at home. And the NC State craft center is closed, like not a lot, but like whenever the university closes, the craft center closes too. So like the big breaks when normally I would have the most time to do pottery, they were closed. Um, and so I wanted something like, something I could do on the side. And I knit for a while, but I don't think I've ever actually finished a scarf. <laughs> Come back to the insanely huge rolling pin. Yeah, I should probably get a smaller one, but this one's kind of nice. One thing I want to get into that's kind of like a fad right now is, um, is rug tufting. I think that looks so cool. Um, and those, that's like when you have like the rug gun and you like have like a big piece of cloth on like a big wooden frame and you just like make the rug. Um, I looked into that over break, but then I realized I kind of have my hands full with pottery and the tufting guns are like $300. So I was like, yeah, I'll just leave it. But people are making some really cool stuff on TikTok and stuff. Yeah, Claire, you should look it up because um, even if you don't have TikTok, like I don't have TikTok, my sister just showed it to me on TikTok, um, but like Instagram Reels has a lot of rug tufting videos or like if you look up hashtag rug tufting on Instagram, you can see a lot of cool stuff. And it looks like there's a lot of like initial startup costs, but once you have like covered all that, I think it's like pretty straightforward from there. Like, I don't think it's a really hard thing to, to master, um, which is cool. Like, I feel like with pottery, I don't know if I would have felt comfortable making at home without like a bunch of lessons, but maybe that's just how I am. Okay. Where was I? Hopefully, these are going to be long enough now. No, not quite. Soon, I'll only have to attach one piece instead of two. That would be nice. Yeah, definitely a lot of equipment. But I think, like, I mean, the main cost is, like, the tufting gun. And then... After that, like, you can build the wooden frame, and I think, like, if you build it yourself, it's, like, 20 bucks. But there's also, like, the cloth that you have to use and the special. Yeah. No, you're definitely right. There's, there's a lot. That's what, like, that's, like, the reason why I didn't get into it was because it was too expensive. Because also you got to buy all that yarn, too. And like, nice yarn is not cheap, as I learned from my research. Now it's nice to be working with clay that's not super dry anymore. I know you guys, you guys probably can't really tell because you're not feeling it, but there's a big difference between the clay I just rolled and the clay I was using before.
This pore has kind of an interesting shape. I'm going to see if I can alter it in a second. I think I might try and alter the form a little bit. Because, like, this is where, like, paddling would come in, but I don't have my paddle. There we go, the shape's changing a little bit. This lighting is nice with the clay. Very moody. You can also use this tool to kind of like 
shows up the same. Uh, thank you. This is supposed to be a sake pourer, um, but it's kind of, we'll see what, it might be a vase. We'll see what it turns into because I'm having trouble making the neck as narrow as I want it to be. It's getting there. These are the little sake cups. I think I'm actually going to turn the light on because it's getting kind of hard to see. Much better. But now you can see all the little mistakes I'm making. <laughs> But essentially what I'm doing now is I'm trying to make the neck, the neck narrow so you get kind of like the sense of pouring, like the, you know, you get the, the big bottom, the narrow neck. And it, it's coming along. It's kind of, I think I'm struggling right now with the dryness of it, or the wetness of it actually. Like the bottom's really dry and the top is a bit more wet. And so it's an eternal struggle <laughs> to keep it all the way you want it to be. I don't think I'm going to finish this before the stream is over at 6, but I definitely will put a picture of it on my Instagram story when I am done, regardless of what it turns out to be. And if it doesn't turn out to be a sake pour, I'll just make another sake pour. Um, sometimes clay has a mind of its own, and you set out to make one thing, and something else comes along. But it's always good practice. Um, but yeah, if you guys are interested in seeing it, you can check out my Instagram story later. Probably won't, probably won't do it tonight if I make another one, but I'll definitely finish this in whatever form it takes tonight. Thank you, Isaac.
I think if this shrinks though in the kiln, it will be like the perfect size socket core. Oh, it's cute. Oh, thanks guys. <laughs> I'm glad you like it. It's been like a, a learning curve for me. I think as you'll see, like when I start doing like um, Twitch streams with the wheel, how much faster like wheel building or not wheel building, wheel throwing is. Um, and so like, if I sat down for two hours at the wheel, I'd probably make like six pieces, which is about as many as I can make before my hands get tired. Um, and like I get, <laughs> I literally get too weak to throw anymore, but like this, it's been like so long and I've been working on just this one piece. Hand builders definitely like, I think, well, it depends, but hand builders do put like a lot of time into their pieces. I think I'm gonna have just enough flat. I think this is like, you wrap your hands around it, pour it. I kinda want, I think I might have to take out the huge rolling pin again. I always get so worried I'm gonna lose these little exacto bits. Because I've done it before.
<laughs> like using the screen as a way to see if it's even or not. So it's got a little indentation, but maybe you can see if it goes through. It'll be six o'clock by the time. Okay. Thank you, Isaac, for the reminder. This is not done. I'm going to try and finish it, and I'll post it on my Instagram story. Um, we'll see how it turns out. And I will be here next week, Tuesday at 6, making more. I don't know what I'll be making next week. I will decide sometime between now and then. Um, but thanks to everyone who watched. Shout out to Isaac for moderating. Um, you guys all asked a lot of really great questions, so I enjoyed doing this a lot. Um, just a last like snapshot of what what has been accomplished today. Got the four sake cups, which I'm gonna put the little ring around at some point, and then the sake pourer, which is almost done. Thank you. Bye guys.